they had a, yeah, an, an orange ball. Yeah. It was the same ball with the pink yeah, and orange. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It was easier to spot. Yeah, yeah. How are we going to get Polo back to even the bottom level to start climbing mm -hmm. back up there? Coaches. We need the coaches. It, it, it gets exciting. Yeah. And I, I remember days we used to have the stand full of people. A small number of people will be familiar with the golden age of Irish polo, that great history period for about 25 years between the 1890s and the outbreak of the First World War, when huge crowds, up to 40,000, attended polo matches in Ireland. Clane History Society organised an evening to talk about the past of polo and the discussion quickly turned to the future and how the game can get back. We also concentrated on Kildare's glorious past. They won the All-Ireland Championship three times, 1910, 1913, and 1920. And because the competition was discontinued, it means Kildare have been uncontested All-Ireland champions for the last 100 years. Bigger than Gaelic football, that was the position polo was in Ireland. One of the first historians of the game said Irish polo has formed a public of its own to watch and enjoy the game outside the narrow circle of players and their friends. At its peak, an Irish team won the silver medals in the polo event at the Olympics. Our love affair with polo goes back to the origins of the game and Parnellite Ireland took the game to heart 25,000 at the Polo Final, 5,000 at the All-Ireland Football Final. When an army team played an Irish team, the attendance could be higher, 40,000 in 1910. A world leader in 1914 in Polo. By 1922, Ireland was nowhere to be seen. Every sport has its origin myths. Chasing steeples in Cork in 1753, William Webb Ellis from Tipperary picking up and running with a rugby ball in 1823, John McAleary going on honeymoon to Scotland and bringing home soccer, and seven men in Thurless founding the GAA. Polo's origin myth is in Hounslow Heath in England in 1869. A cavalry officer, Edward Hartop, organised the first match, and the 10th Hussars was his regiment. The opposition were the 9th Lancers. Both have very strong connections with Ireland leading us to speculate that they may have been practising over the previous year on Irish soil. Two of the participants in that first match were Irish, Bill Beresford from Waterford, the famous Waterford family, and Richard St. Ledger Moore from Killashee in Kildare. Both played on the team for the Ninth Lancers. The Ninth Lancers, seen here in a propaganda portrait from the Indian War of Independence, had just returned from India. And Edward Hartup was a frequent visitor to Ireland. Here he is disembarking from Holyhead in 1866. 1867 was a landmark year in the struggle for Irish independence. And the two British cavalry regiments were both involved in suppressing the Fenian rebellion. We see here the 9th Lancers based in Kilmainham in Dublin and the 10th Hussars in Dundalk. The band of the 9th Lancers plays for the Lord Lieutenant. And the large Irish contingent in the 10th Hussars included John Boyle O'Reilly, who was recruiting for the Fenians. We could expect six regiments of cavalry from the British Army to be stationed in Ireland. In the aftermath of the rebellion, that increased to seven. And on the night of 3rd March, 1867, when the rebellion took place, the 9th Lancers were dispatched from Kilmainham to Tala to round up Fenians. The 10th Hussars, Edward Hartup's regiment, were not immediately involved, but here they are hunting and participating in horse sports near Dundalk, where they were based. We will return to the 9th Lancers, but here they are marching to Newbridge and onwards to England, where they ended up in Hauslow. The origins of polo are a straight, unobstructed gallop all the way back to the great days of the Persian Empire, of Shah Abbas looking at his matches in Esfahan. It's been turned into a square now with lots of tourists, but this is where polo was invented, and they played polo here right up to the beginning of the 20th century. The landscape of the square has been changed, so you cannot play polo in Esfahan today. Coffee shops near the grounds show you what it was like when it was laid out as a polo field. There are horses there now, horse-drawn carriages. It's one of the most beautiful squares in the world. It becomes teeming with life 
as people empty into it in the long evenings. This is modern day Iran, a far cry from Shah Abbas's time, the old pavilion from where the Shah watched his polo matches is still there, but different kinds of activity fill the square now. When polo returns to this square, it is purely for exhibition purposes. The English claim to have invented most of the modern sport codes. Hurling in 1886. But the game had been played in Ireland for two decades. Valentine Erwin may have brought a version of the game back to Roscommon in the 1860s. Cavalry regiment playing in Limerick in Rathban in 1868. What were the regiments doing in Rathban? We have evidence that the 9th Lancers and the 10th Hussars came together in Munster. The 9th Lancers en route to Newbridge, to Hounslow. The 10th Hussars leaving Hounslow to go to India. That is likely when the match took place. The foundation myth of Polo. A year earlier, both regiments came into contact in Munster. A column of the 10th Hussars moved to Thurles in reaction to the Fenian Rebellion. Valentine Baker, a colourful character. Here he is with his great mate, the Prince of Wales, later Edward VII. The Prince, the heir to the Crown of England at Punchestown in 1868. Valentine Baker was with him. Valentine did not change the rules of polo, but he changed the rule of design of railway carriages after an unfortunate and, as it was described, ill-judged incident with a young lady. Would never happen in polo today, of course. And here we have the 10th Hussars hunting, following the pack of the 9th Lancers in County Cork. The good captain dashed at full gallop over a crop of young vetches belonging to a man called Murphy. The sturdy peasant seized the captain's horse and bringing him to a standstill, complained of the trespass. Captain Dorian gallantly replied, you and your vetches be damned. Murphy pursued Captain Dorian in court and was paid compensation and £170 damages and an enormous sum at the time. References to polo in Ireland came thick and fast after Bill Beresford and Richard St. Ledger Moore participated in that origin myth match. Another match in Gormanstown Strand that Edward Hartup participated in. Carlo playing the 8th Hussars and eventually the All-Ireland Polo Club and its lease in the Phoenix Park of nine acres. And the earliest documented club, 1871, the Carlow County Club were playing polo. Archdeacon Jemison in Kileshen, Prior Wandersford in Castlecomer. A club in Kildare wanting to play polo if possible second oldest polo club in the world from 1872 and laws of the game that preceded the Hurlingham club rules by 11 years. An active committee that negotiated special rates with the railway companies so ponies could be transported to matches. John Watson from County Meath who invented the backhanded stroke. He participated in some of the major polo matches of the time, the polo equivalent of the Ryder Cup in golf. and people who were established as crowd favourites, an active club network, and a patron, Arthur, son of the Queen Victoria, causing consternation when he fell off his horse. An All-Ireland Polo Cup, dominated by regimental teams, but occasionally won by an Irish club. In 1890, an Irish Polo Union with its own draw for the Intercounty Championship. Conaghy and Kilkenny, an intercounty ground for polo, now used for GAA. The analogy bears examination, for large crowds followed intercounty polo in the way they follow intercounty GAA today. The Kildare County Club was more interested in rugby football and tennis, but it did have enough room for polo and the man to take the initiative was Richard St. Ledger Moore, participant in 
the origin myth match. His home in Kilishi is now a hotel. He was from a prominent equestrian family. Here he is hunting at the 18 mile stone near Punchestown, listed with the grandees of County Kildare. The Road Club was started in 1890 to be called the County Kildare Polo Club, with the chair occupied by Richard St. Ledger Moore, master now of the Kildare Hounds. Thomas Ritchie from Art Clock was to be secretary. Kildare played the Royal Dublin Fusiliers a large attendance of ladies at the match, unfortunately played in a steady down back in Halverstown for a match for four handsome silver cups presented by Mr. Edmund Johnson of Grafton Street in Dublin, a large attendance of country people and a good sprinkling of officers from the Curragh. Moore, Blacker, the Roebuck and Ritchie defeating Carlo in the first round of the Intercounty Championship and the very first All-Ireland final, Kildare against Fermanagh. The first goal was scored by Tom Ritchie from Artlock, but Kildare were defeated as they were against Sligo. In 1894 and again in 1895, and some of the best polo to be seen in Ireland is to be found in the County Cup. Sligo dominated the honours list. Two separate West Meath teams won three titles each, with just four players on a team, a handicap system and a rigid hierarchy which emphasised the importance of the playmaker. One strong personality could organise a winning county team and ensure their dominance. Charles O'Hara in Sligo, Anthony Maud in Fermanagh, Marshall Murray in Westmead, Olympic silver medalist Percy O'Reilly, Hugh Wilson in North Westmead, Jack McCann in Dublin, Thomas Levens Moore in Mead and then in Dublin. And of course Kildare, who moved from Halverstown to the Castletown estate in 1902. The Connollys were not living in Castletown, so it was Mr. Belly who granted the land for a polo field to the Kildare Polo Club. It was laid out by William Dees, one of the few Catholics to play the game. Kildare hosted a popular tournament at Castletown and Prince Henrik, brother of the Kaiser in 1902. Kildare's first win in an All-Ireland final, 1910, by four goals to three against Dublin. A second success in 1913, by five goals to two against Antrim, and by five goals to three in 1920 against Dublin. The last All-Ireland to be played, John Hardress Lloyd from Shinron in Offaly. The tragic Arthur Shirley Ball of Mead, who died before the county won their only All-Ireland, and the other contenders who had to rely on first season ponies. Carlo twice beaten All-Ireland finalists, Derry and Antrim also beaten in All-Ireland finals. Military figures such as Ulick Brown and Michael Remington and the war that changed everything. The impact on Protestant landowning Ireland was disproportionate and devastating. Among the casualties, Richard St. Ledger Moore's son, Anthony Maud, powerhouse of the Fermanagh team, lost three sons and 21 nephews and cousins. Carlo Meads and Waterford attempted to revive in 1918. Tournaments fell like dominoes, although there was an attempt to revive the annual match between England and Ireland for the Patriotic Cup. Under the rules, an Irish father would have qualified a player for Ireland. Ireland won five times and were at their best just before the outbreak of the war. By now, the focus had moved across the Atlantic. The All-Ireland Polo Club toured America. In Argentina, John Trail made his name. In America, the Rourkes, 10 goal handicap players, the highest ranking in polo. They did not play for Ireland. In fact, Ireland stopped participating. Guatemala has qualified for the finals. Ireland hasn't even played. Ireland against England was revived, but soon descended instead into a club match. The last large crowd was seen in 1932. The crowds were lost to polo, but not to equestrian sport. In 1926, an international show jumping competition on the quiet day at Dublin Horse Show and a new military team was in action. Aga Khan Cup Day 
soon started getting the large crowds that once came to Poland. An attendance of 44,000 in 1937. When they doubled the admission charge, it fell back to 30,000 in 1938. The Irish Army show jumping team won five Aga Khans in a row when Ireland decided to boycott Hitler's Olympics in 1936. It almost certainly cost them the gold medal. And Kildare too had its horse show here in Straffan. Polo in Ireland was nearly extinct. The nine acres used for agriculture during the Second World War was not rendered playable again until 1952, a revival of sorts in the 1970s. Polo ponies were imported from Argentina by Jack Beresford, Lord Waterford, an eight-goal handicap player whose great-great-granduncle had played in the foundation myth game of polo back in 1869. And Michael Herbst, who set up a polo centre in Wicklow. Memo to Pony, today's moves. Renata Coleman. And Hugh Donay, the father of Irish polo. Kim Malahi's reportage for the Irish Field recorded how polo grew with sponsorship and patronage in the Celtic Tiger years, but then fell off afterwards. There is a new generation of young players like Evan Power and Tommy Aitatego. But Jimmy Keane says Irish polo needs to rid itself of its past connections with privilege and hierarchy. The Irish County Polo Association holds out a future for the sport with closer association with county hunts. But there is much uncertainty. The future of a sport that has such a delicious and interesting history in Ireland.